Hello students, welcome back to the course on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. In the module 3, I'd introduce you to what is perception. We have discussed what you understand by perception. We have also looked into some of the initial understanding or the development of perception, venturing into even selective perception. But today, in the second lecture, we'll discuss deeper into factors that influence perception. I'm Dr. Abraham Sirlaisek. I'm a faculty here at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Let's start with the theme. Meaningful interaction potentially improves empathy towards others. So this is the theme on which we'll start today's lecture by initiating a thought-provoking understanding on factors that influence perception. Let's look into the factors. The first set of factors would be in terms of the situation. When we look into the situation, there could be time, work setting, social setting. There could be a situation where, as, as if you recollect in the initial classes of this course, I mentioned that there are situations where the same people behave in a different way. Similarly, let's take that understanding in a realistic context in terms of perception. Same stimuli, there are possibility that you tend to display a behavior in a different fashion. It could be the same stimuli. So it depends on the perception you have with respect to that particular stimuli. And in those situations, the first one would be time. Let's say you are in a favorable uh, mood. You are in a very encouraging mood or highly confident in the morning hours. You are very energetic. So the time plays a critical role when it comes to perception. Similarly, work setting, you are amongst people whom uh, you admire or who are there to welcome you or to motivate you, to encourage you or to boost every single step of yours, then you have a different perception. There could be a social setting whereby people are more, let's say, apprehensive. They are doubtful about you. They, they do not like the way you walk, you act, you talk, the, the way you actually uh, mingle with others. All those situations might take or prevent you from taking a step towards the action. So there are situations like time, work setting or even social setting that dictate the perception. Another important set of factors could be factors in the perceiver. The perceiver's attitude, his or her motives, interest, experience, expectations are all critical when it comes to perception. Let's look into uh, situations where there are people who, who have a, a certain attitude towards a set of people. So in those particular situations, that attitude reigns over the perception of the act or the individual per se. Let's say uh, I have a different certain negative attitude towards a particular individual. That individual might be doing the kindest of the kind act he might be helping others, he might be maybe uh, trying to solve a problem, a very critical problem in the organization. But because of my attitudes towards that particular person, I tend to perceive or I tend to have a negative perception about him. So that is the attitude. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not so concerned about uh, the outcome. I'm concerned about what he or she is up to. I'm doubtful, I'm skeptical about the motive. So in those situations, a perception could be different. Similarly, the interest, the experience, the expectations. I have a, let's say, a big, large expectation of a particular group. And let's say they, they do a decent performance, but still my expectation of the performance that they may display being very large, it is going in counter purpose with actually what they have come up with. Then they have come up with a decent, decent performance. Let's not deny the fact. But the problem is that my expectation set were too high. So the perception also is influenced by the expectation. And the third important factor is the factors in the target. Let's look into a particular scheme of things. It could be novel, there could be motion, sounds, size, background, proximity, similarity. Let's look into a particular target per se. You are in a, in a situation where there is a certain different sound that uh, a particular entity is 
giving out or let's say uh, some particular uh, vibration some some particular background in terms of let's say it's it's a big discussion when it happens in psychology signal versus uh, background the noise versus background thing so what happens basically is how you distinguish the signal from the noise if let's say you see a particular individual in a holy place the same individual might have a very different perception or you see the same individual in a in a in a place which he or she was supposedly should not be you find it that you perceive it in a totally different way so background matters so is the proximity and similarity let's look into a situation where uh, you as an individual is having certain proximity to a particular set of group in the in the organization you tend to feel that whatever the group does as a result of the problem analysis and outcome finding they are in a successful mode but another group which is actually giving out good solutions to the problem because of lack of similarity or lack of possible uh, affinity towards them you tend to have a different perception altogether about that particular set of group so the factors in the target factors in the perceiver and moreover factors in the situation these are the three critical aspects which are uh, determining the influence on perception let's look into stereotyping one of the most important discussed aspect when it comes to uh, perception now stereotyping we had a very quick discussion in the initial lectures if you recollect i have also given you some of the possible causes why people stereotype but let's look into stereotype in detail stereotype is nothing but the process of assigning traits to people based on their membership to a particular social category now this is interesting because if we look into stereotype formation it happens because of shared belief across society now it's not because that you have a, a particular belief about one particular individual or a community or a set of people etc the shared belief is common among a lot of people and that is why the stereotype thrives or the stereotyping of those particular set of people has taken momentum another important aspect could be many a time stereotype do not emerge out of experience if it was emerging out of experience there could be some kernels of truth associated with that but many a time you see that platforms like media or culture or cultural influencers they tend to influence a stereotype about a particular set of people so this is also another way or another cause of formation of stereotype and the third important is the kernel of truth is distorted many a time there is some element of truth associated with this it might be that there might be a, a certain performance pattern of a particular set of people but that performance pattern might be not lagard or lazy that performance pattern might not be inefficient manner but still because the kernel of truth is distorted you tend to uh, define or uh, delineate that particular performance of the particular group as inefficient so this could be some of the some of the reasons why or how the stereotypes are formed then let's look into why people actually uh, form stereotype or why people stereotype so we had had some initial cursory understanding about stereotyping in the previous lectures we looked into uh, stereotyping how it, it it is being created but let's look that into stereotype in a greater detail filling information gap is the first and the foremost aspect when we look into why people stereotype there are certain information available available about a set of people a, a group of people within an organization outside an organization so i do not have that level of patience in me to go and fetch the correct information or the remaining information about the particular group i tend to fill the information void so i try to make my own common sense work and try to connect the dots it might be wrong it might be right but this is in effect 
one of the reason why people stereotype. The second important aspect is non-conscious energy saving. This is something which has warranted a discussion in one of the previous lectures and I have dealt about this in a greater fashion. But let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's say we have 100 units of energy. If that 100 units of energy is to be employed in one activity, I would be more thankful, I would be more happy. But the problem is, we have let's say 100 units of that energy, our concentration is being distributed across different aspects. It could be across different people, it could be across different activities, it could be uh, across different thought processes. But if we are able to consolidate all the 100 units of energy, focus on the particular target, then we will be able to achieve more. So in this perspective, we look into non-conscious energy saving methodology is a instigator or is a natural reason why people stereotype. We do not want to actually spend energy outside, rather we tend to conserve our energy and this non-conscious energy, sa energy saving is what leads to stereotype. Another important aspect is need for cognitive closure. Many a time uh, we tend to have gaps in our cognitive uh, closure. We, need, we are people who, who want to have comprehensive understanding about some aspect of uh, individual. It could be with respect to their behavior, it could be with respect to the personality, it could be with respect to their attitude. So we tend to uh, make a closure by some available information. It could be wrong, it could be right, but Essentially, it is a reason why stereotype is being formed. Another important, the fourth important reason why people stereotype could be social identity. When you look into social identity, it is mainly because uh, how people are known within the group, how people distinguish themselves within the group. And one of the most critical element here is to understand that when you are looking into social identity, it is boosting your self en enhancement. It is trying to project that you have a better understanding of other people and also it validates the fact that you are a part of that particular community or he or she is part of that particular community. So this is the reason why people stereotype and this is essential in understanding the different factors influencing perception. Let's now look into the specific perceptual process and problems. The first one is categorization. When we look into categorization, this is the first and the foremost aspect which comes under specific perceptual problems. Grouping individuals, facilitating differentiation. This is why people generally go for uh, the perceptual process as such. To minimize the cognitive load, what we do is we tend to group. Even stereotype is an extension or is logical extension of categorization. Basically, we tend to put people into baskets as Indians, as Europeans. This will help us to understand and work with those set of people in a more effective manner. So let's look into people who are Indians, who are Europeans. Maybe we are given an organizational context to study the cultural differences. Now it becomes quite easy for us to bring people into uh, different baskets and consider them in a holistic way. So this is the relevance of categorization. Another important thing could be homogenization. Homogenization is nothing but simplifying perception, overlooking the individual uniqueness. Ma mainly we think of, you know, examples like thinking all Americans have similar attitude and characteristics. Here we tend to look at people as a homogeneous group. This again is an attempt to reduce your cognitive load. So when you are looking into perceptual process per se, be it categorization, be it homogenization, the, the reason is to reduce the cognitive load. But here, when you look into homogenization specifically, we 
tend to simplify perception. We tend to uh, overlook about individual differences that exist. We tend to see that, okay, you are having a different language, but you belong to India. So, you, right now you are being studied or you are being considered under a, a situation or a context of, let's say you are in US. So, in US, you are from West Bengal, you are from Delhi, you are from Haryana, you are from Kerala, it does not matter. I trend, tend to homogenize and put everybody into a single basket called as Indians. This makes a understanding or work working with them relatively easy. And the third important aspect is differentiation. Differentiation is more about favorable group assignment. When you are looking into a particular segment of favoritism, for example, it, this differentiation comes from the basic fact that the people who are quite similar to me in the group, they are the good people or they are the rational decision makers, they are the best decision makers. And similarly, the people who are not part of my group or not similar to me or not related to me are, let's say, not so good in terms of decision making, not so proactive, they are highly reactive, they are highly lazy. So, this creates a good guy, bad guy approach within the group. But perceptual processes are of three kinds, categorization, homogenization and third, differentiation. Now, let's look into problems that have emerged with stereotyping. The first and the foremost one is it leads to perceptual biases. We have looked extensively into stereotyping, what causes it, what are the reasons why people go for stereotyping. But when we look into the problems with stereotyping, we tend to understand that there is generalization beyond individual variation that is happening. So, this is one of the basic reasons why perceptual biases are formed. And uh, we, we deal with perceptual biases in greater detail in the coming slides. But tend to understand here, we try to understand that generalization beyond individual differences could be dangerous. Because there are certain individual differences. We tend to see people who are hardworking. But unfortunately, they being put into a particular basket or they being particularly put into a group of lazy people might create an additional load in them to perform. So even if they are performing, they being associated or related to a particular segment might work against them. So this is another, this is one of the most critical aspect of perceptual bias, transfer of stereotypical features. This is yet again another aspect when you are looking into a group per se. An individual might be highly different from the group, but since you are being put in the particular group and the whole consideration or the whole approach towards you is based on the fact that you are a member of the group. I hope you are understanding this. You are particularly a hardworking person, but unfortunately, you are a member of a group which is understood as lazy. So, ultimately what happens that whatever you do, you are being termed as a lazy person or you are a part of a group which always comes out with inefficient solution. So, how effective and efficient your solution are, you are trying to bring it out within the group, that is pitched outside to the organization, still it gets negated for the very fact that it came from the group. So, this is one of the critical aspect of perceptual bias. Another aspect is stereotype threat. When we look into diverting energy and attention by overcoming or trying to overcome stereotype. Let's look into uh, some of the aspect as I've already mentioned it. This is, the stereotype threat is an extension of our previous discussion. For example, you are a part of a group which is an adversary in the whole organization or you are a part of the group to which you actually do not belong 
according to your your performance according to your trait or some other way but for ease of categorization people have put you into the group in their mind so to overcome the whole veil or the whole uh, uh, stereotype against you because of the group you have to work hard in other words it weakens your self efficacy so basically if you want to pitch and work above that you have to put an extra effort and this is where you have to conserve your energy and it takes a lot of energy to work above your stereotype laying foundation for discriminatory attitudes and behavior when you are in a system which is having unintentional systemic discrimination there could be some organizations which are not intentionally but unintentionally there is a systemic discrimination against let's look into some organization which are against women in that particular stereotyping there is a common understanding within the organization that women do not perform as good as men if that is the personal understanding with most of the people within the organization what happens typically is that there is a systemic discrimination and this will in effect lead to discriminatory attitudes and behavior and when you are in an environment which is motivating or encouraging or which is giving a fertile ground for the such discriminatory practices what happens is that there is an unequal evaluation that is happening when you are in a situation of unequal evaluation you tend to get demotivated you tend to be uh the under performer even when you are performing the best in the organization so this is the contradictory aspect when it comes to stereotyping even if you are the best performer in the organization because of the very fact that you are part of the stereotype you are part of the particular group you tend to be labeled as an underperformer the fourth important aspect is intentional discrimination in the previous point if you are talking about unintentional systemic discrimination here we are talking about intentional discrimination or prejudice this is mainly because of unfounded negative attitudes there could be situations where the organization uh, specifically Uh, creates or purports or deliberately uh, nurtures a sort of discrimination this is to enable that a certain set of people do not get to the higher levels of decision making higher levels of hierarchy so if you are stuck up unfortunately in such an organization and people tend to demotivate you for the simple reason that there is an intentional discrimination or prejudice that is happening then it's unfortunate that there could be unfounded negative attitudes and there is a huge deliberate unfair disadvantage that is going against you so in those situations whatever be the effort you are putting in in other aspects which i have discussed if you have let's say tremendous energy and you are trying to put on extra effort to overcome what you were actually dealing with or actually you were required to do you could have still perform better but in such cases where there is a intentional discrimination that is being motivated or encouraged in a organic way it is very difficult so this is yet another critical problem with stereotyping now let's come into something which is very interesting yet very critical in terms of perception and that is attribution theory attribution process is the perceptual process of deciding whether an observed behavior or event is caused largely by internal or external factors let's understand this in a deeper way there could be some situations there could be some events every single event the happening or the execution of that particular event is because there are some internal factors or there are some external factors internal factors could be let's say if you are a person who has executed that particular event the internal factor could be your personality your attitude your predisposition towards a particular event or set of people 
how you actually can tame your emotion or how you can use your emotion all these factors are internal factors there are some external factors where it is done what is the context what are the favorable or unfavorable elements in that particular event or there could be situation that you are taking up the task and executing it among barriers or among people who are actually against you so all these contextual factors are the external factors so if you have understood these internal factors and external factors now it will be very easy for you to understand what is specifically attribution as a process and what do you mean by attribution theory let's look into situations where we are defining behavior causes let's look into a situation where we are evaluating the internal and external factors please remember that there are three rules of attribution the first one is consistency consistency is very very critical let's see or let's look into a situation where same stimuli same response is elicited it could be with respect to person a person b or person c for example let's look into a situation where uh, you as an individual are venturing into an organization you are getting an organizational en environment which is highly supportive highly participative democratic you tend to bring out the best performance your friend let's say person b comes into the organization same positive vibe same positive organizational supportive climate very participative climate he or she also performs person c maybe you don't know the guy person c comes into the organization all the context remains the same same aspect same same individual uh, same organizational context same supportive element you tend to Uh, he or she tends to perform in a similar way so with the same available stimulus if there are people who are performing in the same way same response to the same stimulus you can see consistency the second important rule of attribution is distinctiveness distinctiveness is associated more with uncommon behavior to a particular stimuli let's look into that from an other perspective same stimuli but different reactions or different behavioral patterns there are people who might smoke when they are only with their friends there are people who do not smoke in any other situations so here the randomness is bit high the distinctiveness is bit high so this is yet again another important rule of attribution and the third important aspect is consensus consensus happens when you tend to have the same situation different people working in same situation in the same way so if i may sum up consistency was more about the same person performing in a same way let's take an example if you have not understood let's look into a organizational context let's look into uh, your organization you are going into your organization and unfortunately you have a boss who who yells at you who scolds who is shouting at you you tend to see that every morning 9:30 he calls a meeting and he shouts at you or she shouts at you so there could be a reason associated with that and you tend to relate that reason to internal factor that is maybe his or her personality this is consistency so consistently every morning he comes in he shouts at you or she shouts at you this is consistency so you tend to attribute that to internal factor of his or her behavior which could be personality the second important aspect as i mentioned is distinctiveness you are looking at an uncommon behavior ideally the person is a person who smokes but he smokes only when he is with his friends not in any other situation so this looks into distinctiveness and the third important aspect is consensus where all the people 
relatively perform in the same way if they are given the same stimuli. So these are the three basic rules of attribution and when we understand these three rules of attribution holistically, we tend to see that there are situations which are known as attribution errors and these are one of the most interesting aspects of the entire course in organizational behavior. The first one is self-serving bias. Self-serving bias is basically, as I've already mentioned, there is a, a set of internal factors and there are a set of external factors. When you are attributing the outcome more to the internal factor rather than the external factor. In other words, let's say you as an individual will attribute the success of your, let's say you are part of a group and the solution that you brought out as part of the, uh, the whole group was highly applauded, was taken up to the next level and the organization went ahead and implemented. It got high returns and sales or the revenue increase many fold because of that particular suggestion you gave or the group gave. You tend to dictate now or you tend to come out with a theory that this is because of me the internal contribution of me that enabled that. Rather, you tend to de-escalate or tend to not appreciate the significance of the context. The context here could be the contribution of the people in the group. It could be a collective decision. It could be that you had, though you had the main idea, there were a lot of interconnected ideas that came up and those people, your group mates, help you to bring it to a finality. But you tend to not remember all those things right now. You tend to understand that this success is only because of me. So every success is because of the internal factor. And the loss is because of, if there is a failure that's happening, it is because of an external factor. Maybe because of an, an, uh, the, the same example, if the decision was not taken in your favor, uh, the group leader did not accept the way I proposed or the group leader made some modifications which negated the whole idea which I brought up. So all these aspects are part of self-serving bias. I hope it is clear. Now let's look into another important and interesting aspect which is also called as fundamental attribution error which is also known as correspondence bias. This is with respect to a second party. Now in, in terms of the second party, if we, attend, if we have a general tendency to attribute most of the, the problems with internal factor of the second party and we are trying to negate or undermine the external factors or we are not considering the external factors, it is a fundamental attribution error. It will be clear with an example. Let's look into an organizational setting again where you are part of a group. There is a critical meeting that's happening and your uh, friend Shailesh, he happens to be one of a group mate or a critical element of the group meeting. But unfortunately, he is late. The problem with his being late or the problem why he is late could be, the reason could be that he was stuck up in a traffic. But you as an individual, you tend to relate Silesh is having a certain bit of character which is lazy which is not so punctual or which is not so prompt or result oriented, all these are fundamental attribution errors. He might be delayed or he might be late to the meeting for the simple reason that he was stuck up in the traffic, which was an external factor. But you are highly forced to undermine the external factor and this is classic fundamental attribution error. I hope that would have made the fundamental attribution error clear. It is nothing but a preference for internal attribution against the existing or the realistic external attribution as it should be. Now, very quickly, since we have understood, we will not take much time here in terms of attribution theory, an attempt to determine whether an individual's behavior is internally or externally caused. So basically what happens is that observation leads to interpretation and interpretation leads to attribution of cost. If we look into the three elements, what individual behavior displays, as I already mentioned, the first being consistency. 
If the consistency is high, we tend to relate it to internal. If the consistency is low, we tend to relate it to external. Similarly, the second one distinctiveness, which if the, the distinctiveness is high, we tend to associate it with external and if it is low, we tend to relate it with internal. And the third one is consensus. If it is high, we tend to relate it to external and if it is low, we tend to relate it to internal. So this would complete the attribution uh, theory as such. Now let's look into self-fulfilling prophecy in workplace. Self-fulfilling prophecy is a perceptual process where expectations about a person influence their behavior to align with those expectations. In other words, let's look into this example. A manager's belief in an employee's incompetence. He always or she always believe that, let's say, person A, the employee of the particular organization is highly incompetent. This will lead to limited opportunities and skill stagnation. In other words, it is the initial bias which is running the show all around through the career of person A. Person A otherwise not so uh, incompetent, but somehow the boss or the superior had a notion that this guy is very incompetent. So this self-fulfilling prophecy keeps on going and it has its own negative effects because it's, it, those are the situations where they tend to uh, block uh, or create barriers for the career progression. So self-fulfilling prophecy can be debilitating and detrimental in such situations. The impact is that it highlights the importance of fair and unbiased assessments to avoid hindering career development. Now, contingencies of self-fulfilling prophecies are there like strongest effect at the beginning. The moment you venture into an organization, there are situations where the, uh, the manager or the boss makes an impression about you. So from that perspective, it is very difficult to bring in or to uh, reorient that boss or the superior in a different way, however information you are giving. So initial, when you are, when you, when you are uh, looking at telling things like the first impressions last, this is basically because the strongest effect is at the beginning. There could be a collective influence. It's not that sometimes the boss alone makes a discussion or decision. It is a situation where the group as such makes a collective influence. And there are situations where the influence is on low achievers. Basically, when, when the achievement part is low in itself, there is a self-fulfilling prophecy that uh, whatever they do, it will be mediocre. Now, what happens is because of that initial preconceived notion existing, they are given a, a situation or they are given less chances to thrive and develop. In such situations, you feel that contingency of self-fulfilling prophecies being worked out. Now, the takeaway for leaders is there could be positive expectations, organizational culture, optimistic supervisors are the reason why self-fulfilling pro fulfilling prophecies should not happen in the first place. And even if it is happening, it should be based on the positive expectation. The moment you are looking into positive expectation, it adds on to your outcome. You are, uh, the person starts believing in himself, the person has more motivation to work hard because the management believes in you. So that adds to a cycle, a virtuous cycle rather than a vicious cycle, a virtuous cycle of performance, of a superior performance. And it improves the organizational culture. And if your supervisors are optimistic, the self-fulfilling prophecy takes a virtuous cycle instead of a vicious cycle. Positive organizational behavior focuses on building positive qualities rather than dwelling on the weakness. If you are an organizational manager, if you are a manager at any level, Try to build positive qualities. Try to look into the positive aspects of a person rather than always blaming his weakness. There are some individuals who are always critical, who are always looking cynical. They always look into the negativity, the negative aspects of the particular individual. The concentrating on what is wrong to nurturing and what is right within an organization is the key aspect when we are looking into self-fulfilling prophecy. So self-fulfilling prophecy, if you look into the entirety 
of self-fulfilling prophecy. The supervisor forms expectation about the employee, which happens to be the first step. The supervisor's expectations affect his or her behavior toward the employee, which is the second step. The third one is supervisor's behavior affects employee's ability and motivation. And finally, the fourth step is employee's behavior becomes more consistent with the supervisor's initial expectations. So entire self-fulfilling prophecy, if you look, follows a cycle like this, where the individual is being performing in the organization in such a way. Let's look into other perceptual effects very quickly. The first one is the halo effect. Many a time you might have heard about the halo aspect or the halo in general. Halo effect is nothing but there is a general impression or influence that is being created because of the particular person. There might be a charisma, there might be a certain skill or there might be certain uh, level of disposition or there might be a certain uh, performance or personality which is very attractive, which is very appealing. So because of that, whatever they said and they do, people tend to appreciate and uh, accept it. So it might be that they might be wrong in some situations, but because of the halo effect that they are having, there could be a possibility that the people will tend to go behind them or the people will tend to rally behind them for the simple reason that they feel that whatever they say, whatever they do, it, it is correct. So might be that there, there could be some initial, initial expertise or initial referent power that might have pulled them towards themselves. But having said that, there could be situations where they are wrong. But people generally tend to discount or undermine those situations. And this is an outcome where what we call as halo effect. Another aspect could be false consensus effect. False consensus effect is overestimation of similarity. Basically, it's a selective interaction. It's, it's nothing but a confirmation bias where you tend to set up a group whereby the group is having people who are yes men, right? Or let's look into a situation where you have made a group and whatever you say will be unanimously accepted within the group. So this is giving you a false pretense or a false consensus effect. So basically whatever, it might be detrimental to the organization, it might be detrimental to the other uh, individual careers within the organization. But whatever you do, because you have selected such a people, a bunch of yes men, a bunch of orderly people, whatever you do, they are there to accept it. So this creates a sense of false consensus effect. Another important aspect is recency effect. Recency effect is based on the recent information. There is a potential situation whereby, let's say you are being asked to judge a particular event or you are being asked to find out a solution to a particular problem. So what happens is that based on just the previous interaction you had with the particular individual, under consideration or the situation under consideration, you tend to make judgment. So you are making a, a selective perception there. You are not looking into the entire set of information that is available. Rather, you are making a very selective perception there. So this is the recency effect. And similarly, the primacy effect or the primary effect is quick formation of opinions. Basically, the first impressions last long. This is the basic reason for that. You are part of a, a, a graduate engineering, uh, engineering trainee team. And out of the particular set of, let's say, uh, 20 people who are being recruited and being given training, you are a person who is well-dressed, who comes in, in, in a very punctual way, who is always there at any meeting five minutes earlier any training sessions five minutes earlier. You are very interactive in every single discussion. You are very energetic in every single discussion. Then the initial impression that is formed is very good. So this is the primacy effect that is again another perceptual effect. Let's look into finally what could be the way to improve perception. The awareness of perceptual biases would definitely go long way the awareness of perceptual biases 
would go long way to create or to improve perception. The first one is diversity awareness training. Minimize the discrimination. You tend to give them more information and try to reduce biases. Diversity awareness training is to ensure that there are people from different segments. We have, we have uh, categorically understood this in the previous module of diversity. There are people who are coming from different backgrounds, different environment. You are trying to produce more information to the people at large. So this added information gives you a, a benefit of doubt and you tend to be more aware of your perceptual bias. Another important aspect could be limitation of awareness training. Effectiveness of awareness training could be questionable. There could be complex nature of biases. It could not be that there is only one stereotype that is working. There could be situations where there are multiple perceptual biases at play. Those situations by giving a, a certain level of diversity training might not help. You need to understand, you need to identify the root cause of the particular problem, try to address that then you get to have a, a solution towards the perceptual biases. And the third important aspect could be reducing perceptual biases based on mindfulness, the continuous learning and comprehensive approaches where you are not only just giving information, you are not only giving an idea about a particular segment of people, you are also giving them a little bit training to be sensitive to be mindful, to have a, a, a learning mindset, not a performance oriented mindset where you are just focusing on beating somebody in terms of a competition. Rather, it's more of a, a learning mindset. You have to understand, acknowledge and travel because the journey is a long journey. Now, if we want to look at situations of improving perception, improving self-awareness, there are importance of self-awareness like recognizing beliefs, values, attitudes, understanding biases and there are situations where you tend to reduce perceptual biases by encouraging open-mindedness and promoting non-judgmental attitudes. For improving perception, the best way is to understand the Johari window. Now, Johari window is a model of self-awareness and mutual understanding developed by Lyft and Harry Graham. So there are these four windows, which I'll take you to the next slide and come back. The first one is open area. The second one is blind area. Third one is hidden area. And the fourth one is unknown area. So better, it could be easily understood from the Johari window if it is portrayed like this. There are situations where you know, I know, which is the public area. There are quadrants or there are areas within your mind which you know but I don't know. Basically others and yourself. Those are the blind areas. There are areas which you don't know but I, I know which are essentially the private areas. And there are ultimately the dark areas which neither I don't know or you don't know. So basically those are the dark areas. Having understood this Zohari window, the attempt is to increase the open area, reduce the hidden area, go and thrive and get more feedback, understand more about yourself and finally discovering the unknown area. So there are always situations which can lead to getting more self-awareness and this self-awareness comes only when you tend to discover the unknown area within yourself. So this is the basic objective of Johari window, which is um, you know comprehensively used in marketing, which is comprehensively used in behavioral sessions, etc. But if you want to improve perception, this is one way to go ahead in terms of Johari window. And finally, if you want to improve perception, there should be meaningful interaction. When you are looking at meaningful interaction, where you are engaging in valued and substantial activities with others, fostering understanding mutual awareness. Basically, you are uh, coming with, up with a contact hypothesis. The contact hypothesis, the concept is based on under certain conditions, interactions between people reduce 
perceptual bias is another way i have already mentioned this you are basically giving more information you are giving situations where you can interact you can solve problems so in such situations people are more uh, interactive and people tend to find out solutions to existing problems conditions for effective meaningful interaction you have you could have close collaboration there could be shared goals where people tend to or people are forced to interact people are motivated to interact together and finally enhancing empathy through interaction empathy is the ability to comprehend and be sensitive to emotions thoughts and situations of others so this plays a clear role in reducing attribution error so if you are looking into a global mindset developing perception across borders you have to adopt a global perspective you have to empathize and act effectively across culture you have to process complex information about novel environments and finally you have to develop new multi level mental models so that would essentially end the detailed talk on what do you mean by perception we have looked into different types of perceptual errors different perceptual process in general please tend to understand one thing that if there is a problem if there is a, an activity which has not gone according to what you had planned there is an inherent tendency for you to blame others similarly if somebody is not working according to what you were expecting there is a possibility that you tend to blame his personal attributes because of that particular activity either way both of them are wrong you tend to understand that every single activity has an internal factor has a set of external factors so the reason unless and until you are very clear because of what because of which internal factor because of which external factor that has caused you are ultimately going into a perceptual error and you are making a perceptual bias and error by making any decision related to that so i hope this session would have given you some intriguing insights into what perception is what are the different perceptual processes and what are the perceptual errors see you in the next class till then take care bye bye